10 years ago, I came back to Korea for the first time since I was adopted. That was a big deal. I was also connected with the broader Korean adopted community. It's so easy to take for granted, like maybe the ways in which adoption has critically shaped your identity. But in Korea, you have to confront it every day. I felt like there was some part of me that was missing that I needed to come to Korea to get. I think being adopted can prompt a lot of curiosity and questioning that is actually really aligned with philosophical inquiry. It's like I'm slowly uncovering this big fossil, like I'm kind of slowly uncovering what was lost through adoption day by day. Hi, my name is Hannah. I'm a Korean adoptee from Australia and I'm currently living in Seoul. I didn't know any Korean people growing up. It's like the first three years of my life in Korea were kind of like a big black hole of knowledge. <laughs> growing up, I was curious about Korea, but I was also trying pretty hard to fit in and just act white. I was pretty actively resisting um, and rejecting that Korean part of my identity. An estimated 200,000 children were adopted internationally after the Korean War ended in 1953, with the vast majority ending up in the United States and Scandinavia. Some were also sent to Australia. At the start, most are mixed-race children, the offspring of Korean mothers and American or European military personnel who were in Korea during the war. But the Korean adoption system soon expanded as families abroad began to see adoption as a humanitarian response to the war. Decades later, in the 1980s, the war was a distant memory, but the Korean adoption system continued to grow, reaching its peak in 1985. What was initially a wartime response developed into an established and entrenched practice. A sort of surrogate welfare system that took orphans and the children of unwed mothers and placed them in the homes of often white, often Christian families in the West. In recent years, thousands of Korean adoptees have returned to Korea every year to experience a country most could barely remember. Some, like Hannah, decided to remain in Korea and build a life. In Seoul, Hannah began to meet other adoptees like herself, and with her friend Ryan in Melbourne, their conversations and shared experiences as adoptees soon became a podcast that helps others chart a course through a rich and complex journey. With Adopted Feels, when Ryan suggested it, honestly, I didn't really know that much about podcasts, but our concept was to take these conversations that we were kind of naturally having together privately and just make them more public. I think a lot of adoptees' questions and themes like, who am I? What does it mean to belong? What is home? You know, what is it like to be a body that doesn't always fit into its social environment? Um, these are quite philosophical questions. And that's also why I try to remind myself that it's beneficial for the community when I think we can like sh be vulnerable and share openly about our personal experiences because yeah, often what happens is you get this feedback coming back saying like, oh, me too, like I really resonated with that. So that's been super rewarding and, and such a thrill to, yeah, to hear from people that we don't know. I think it's really important um, to have adoptees uh, take charge of the um, adoptee narrative because in reality it's, it's really only um, an adopted person that can understand what it's like to be ad adopted. Um, it's quite a unique experience to be a transnational, transracial adoptee. I think 
the, the usual media story that you still see is like adoptee who doesn't know anything about Korea coming to Korea for the first time and doing a birth family search, you know, perhaps having this tearful reunion with their birth family and tearfully saying goodbye and like going back to their adoptive country. There's this idea that we're all orphans, which for starters, that's not true. Um, and that, you know, we were saved and given better lives and therefore we should be happy and grateful. And I'm not saying that the reality is, is the opposite of that, but it's like the reality is far more nuanced. You know, I knew I was adopted and it was just kind of way in the background of my life for like 26 years. Then when I went to Korea, I realized I'm also Korean. I came from this very real place. I, I came from this real family. There was a whole culture and a whole language that was completely erased. And also that I'm not alone in this experience, that I'm one of um, approximately 200,000 Korean adoptees. Part of this whole Korean adoption system, which generated millions of dollars for Korea um, and that it wasn't actually driven by poverty, at least um, by the 80s it, it, it wasn't. It was actually um, because of this social stigma um, against single mothers. So to come to terms with all of that, that's, that's quite confronting. Ten years ago, I came back to Korea for the first time since I was adopted. That was a big deal. As in, it was opening multiple Pandora's boxes at the same time. It was my first real exposure to Korea and Korean culture and Korean food, really. I met my birth family on that trip, and I don't know what I was expecting, but I definitely wasn't expecting a place that was so vibrant and dynamic. Being part of the ethnic majority and blending in, honestly, that was such a liberating feeling. It was like, it was a huge high for me. When I got back to Australia, I was kind of a mess because there was just like a lot to process. I was kind of constantly like on Facebook and stuff, um, chatting to some of the adoptees that I'd met in Korea, just trying to make sense of this experience and, and wondering when I could go back and visit again. I think at first when you start to connect with other adoptees, it's really amazing experience because you know, all of these aspects of your own life and identity that maybe the other people around you couldn't necessarily relate to. It's like suddenly you meet this community of people that really gets these things. We recently, for the podcast, we interviewed um, Ki Pyongkin, a friend of ours, and he also described his first trip back to Korea as in like there was his life before that trip and his life after that trip. And I feel very much the same way. You're listening to Adopted Feels with Hannah and Ryan. A podcast on anything and everything adoption related. I first met Key at the Kurut dining table in Seoul. Key looked me in the eye, introduced himself and reached over to shake my hand. Back then, as now, there was something genial and graceful in his manner, perhaps stemming from his childhood in the American South. He was softly spoken, yet assured. Koreans have been leaving Korea for, you know, over a hundred years now, if not longer, you know, longer than, you know, for centuries now. Koreans have been departing Korea for other places and they have become, you know, they didn't, they're not, not Korean. You don't move to China and become Chinese. You know, so you don't leave Korea and become not Korean, but Korea has to allow for more variable forms of what it means to be Korean. Tonight I'm going to Matt and Lauren's apartment in Hapjong. 
and Nat's gonna cook a stew, so that's exciting. And this November is kind of like the, the 10 year anniversary of my first trip back to Korea and the 10 year anniversary of my birth family reunion. And also, you know, just 10 years of like being involved in the adoptee community. And so it's kind of significant for me. So there are a community of Korean adoptees living here in Seoul. And I kind of think of it as like a big extended family um, where, you know, some people might drive you crazy, frankly, but, um, but you also like, you're kind of bound together by this shared experience, this really unique experience of being a Korean adoptee and coming back here and uh, trying to live here, which can be, it's just really hard. Um, honestly. <laughs> I think it's really important, you know, that you're not alone. My name is Matt. I'm originally from Truckee, California, uh, in the United States, and I've been here for about 10 years, nine and a half years, uh, and I am a chef here. Hey. Hi. Hi, Welcome. My name is Jenny, and I was born in Korea, but adopted to the U.S. state of Minnesota when I was 10 months old. And I returned to Korea about ooh, a long time ago, <laughs> more than 15 years ago. <laughs> and um, I work here as an editor. People often ask me what brought me to Korea or why I chose to come back and live in Korea. I felt like there was some part of me that was missing. It's just people in America look at me and they see my Korean face and they assume something about me. They were seeing a Korean person. I felt very much not like a Korean person on the inside. And I didn't even really know what that meant. And so for me, coming back to Korea was uh, in part to try to understand that part of myself and to try to know where I came from. I mean, I think living here has really been a process of like understanding yourself. Maybe the ways in which adoption has critically shaped your identity. Um, but in Korea, you have to confront it every day. When you're talking to a cab driver and they're like, where you, they always ask where you're from. And, um, or, you know, when someone's like, oh, your Korean accent's a little weird or why or whatever. It's like, it, it, it all comes back to that first thing that happened to you, right? As a child, when you were adopted. And so even the mundane here becomes connected to that and it can be like exhausting and, and horrible and heart-wrenching too, but it can also be like really liberatory as well, I think. Coming back to Korea has given me a sense of community <clears throat> that I didn't have before I came here. In the case of most adoptees who grew up in small towns in the middle of nowhere, the rest of your community all looks different from you. And so you're always kind of this isolated person. So I think coming to Korea and finding other adoptees to be in community with, we know that we have experienced similar things and so we don't have to talk about it. Actually, that is kind of a really huge relief. In my head is like, I think what I found here, a big thing is that like, I have power and like my identity as an adoptee gives me power, it gives me perspective like we are living in like margins between worlds the perspective and value that we can bring to like transforming korean society not just a better place for like adoptees or for single mothers but like making society the korean society as a whole like a more just better interesting place like um i think is really important um yeah are you open it? You're the... No, no, you're the... No, you're the... No, 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 no,
inside. Um, thank you both for all your support and encouragement and um, the bed linen that I haven't given back yet. And <laughs> um, thank you for going before where I go now. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. To Instagram this shit. <laughs> Just eat it. it. Stew never looks pretty. Hey man. What are you up to? I'm uh, cooking dinner. What are y'all doing? We just finished cooking dinner. We're eating. What are y'all cooking? Um, made some beef stew with peas in it. Yeah, I saw I saw it on Hannah's Instagram. <laughs> oh, already. <laughs> the world is truly connected. I made a pudding. I hope I didn't overcook it. Um, sticky date? Mm. Oh no. Oh, he needs to go out. Here, come here. Let's go. Let's go outside. I had this really deep curiosity about Korea that wasn't really fulfilled by my shorter trips here. I like that by living here, I get to explore Korea and Korean culture in my own time. This image comes to mind that I'm slowly uncovering this big fossil, like I'm kind of slowly uncovering what was lost through adoption day by day. And I think it can be really triggering, especially like say in the first year or so of living here because you're coming back to the country that gave you up for adoption. And I think I had anger about that that would just kind of like come up. But yeah, it's, it's a work in progress. So I also put on this dance event thing. It's, it's based on no Lights, No Lycra, which is this event that was founded in Melbourne a few years ago. And so you basically dance in a dark room. I think self-expression in general, at least for me, is really good for my mental health. there's something about dancing and non-linear movement that's really beneficial to just connect with your body for that time and just move however you want to. And I kind of missed that here in Korea and there, there didn't seem to be anything exactly like that. So now I just do it with some of my friends and I just like hire some studio and bring some music and then afterwards like we go out to eat together and it's just a really good way to like blow off some steam without getting drunk. <laughs> The experience of moving to any foreign country where you don't really know the language and you don't have a lot of connections and the things that you need to succeed in that society, of course it's going to be difficult and then I think I still don't feel quite finished and I still find magic in little moments um, of living here. I'm learning a lot and enjoying this exploration here.